Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Versett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, welcome back to part two of our online briefing mini series about rural communities, climate, and COVID-19 recovery. Today, we will learn about how the coronavirus outbreak has affected the bioeconomy and what that means for the economic and environmental benefits we derive from biofuels and other products. If you were unable to join us yesterday, we heard an update from three panelists about on-bill financing programs for home energy efficiency improvements in South Carolina. Tomorrow, we will consider the dual threat of natural disasters during a time of a major public health crisis, the COVID-19 outbreak. If you need to catch up or register for tomorrow, you can visit www.esi.org. There you'll find an archived webcast and presentation materials. And while you're there, please take a moment to sign up for our Climate Change Solutions newsletter which is a great way to stay informed about our briefings and other educational and informative resources. Yesterday, in my introduction, I mentioned the EESI's longstanding commitment to better understanding the impacts of climate change on rural areas. And those impacts are different than those affecting urban areas. At EESI, we like to focus on solutions. And again, approaches to climate change mitigation and adaptation are different depending on the geography and demographics of where you are. Today, we will discuss the potential of biofuels. Biofuels are sourced from rural areas, but their potential benefits extend to cities and towns. It's a well-rounded climate solution. As the US transportation sector undergoes a longer term zero carbon transition, biofuels can be used to reduce emissions while supporting rural economies and contributing to improved air and water quality throughout the country. It sounds like a cliche, but biofuels represent a win-win-win climate change solution. The first win is economic. Biofuels provide economic development opportunities in low population areas where feedstocks are grown, harvested, and processed, all of which compares favorably to costly and unsustainable fossil fuel extraction. The second win is environmental. Life cycle carbon emissions from biofuels are about 80% lower than those from fossil fuels. We'll need liquid fuels for ground transport for some time, and we'll need liquid fuels for air travel for some time longer. Increased use of biofuels would reduce emissions from the transportation sector, which is currently the largest slice of the greenhouse gas pollution pie. The third is especially relevant in present circumstances, public health. COVID-19 takes aim at our lungs, which are already exposed to harmful particulate pollutants and aromatics, which are nasty carcinogenic gasoline additives. If we increase the use of biofuels in our cars and trucks, we could do without gasoline aromatics and there would be healthier air for everyone to breathe. At a time when we should be doing everything possible to improve the health of the public, as you listen to our panelists today, I encourage you to consider how we want to recover, to change our old unhealthful ways of doing things for the better. Why go back to heavily subsidized fossil fuel consumption when we have a better alternative choice? As a win-win-win climate solution, biofuels can and should be part of that new way of doing things. One last bit of logistics before we turn to our panelists. Because we are online today, I cannot call on you if you have a question. So please follow EESI on Twitter, at EESI Online, and send in your questions that way. You can also send an email to EESI at EESI.org. We will draw from your question submissions after we hear from our panelists during our Q&A session. And let me welcome our first panelist, Patty Judge. Patty served two terms in the Iowa mm -hmm. Senate, she also served as Iowa's Secretary of Agriculture, where she worked on to work tirelessly to promote renewable fuels, ethanol, and biodiesel in particular. Under her leadership, renewable energy grew to become an integral part of Iowa's economy. She continued to work for the people of Iowa as a Lieutenant Governor from 2006 through 2010. And in 2017, she founded Focus on Rural America, a nonprofit organization dedicated to examining and addressing the problems of the most rural parts of the country. Patty, Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me uh, to be with you today. It's, it's a real honor. Um, I will start by uh, saying, uh, as you just heard, uh, I'm now working with a nonprofit group that is called Focus on Rural America. Uh, we were founded after the 2016 elections uh, when uh, we were very much aware uh, of some significant changes in uh, voting and thinking in, in the rural parts of uh, not just Iowa, but across the Midwest, Rust Belt. Um, 
we wanted to take a look at what was driving voting decisions in, in rural America uh, and what uh, was going on. Uh, why uh, are the population uh, continuing to de decline? What issues do uh, rural voters find important? Uh, we have done a considerable amount of research and polling on issues in rural America, uh, trying to look at trends and policy drivers. Uh, we've worked with uh, candidates and policymakers. Um, recently, uh, we were very much involved in the Iowa caucuses, uh, the uh, many cam presidential campaigns that uh, came to the state. Um, we helped them draft rural plans. Uh, actually, we dra helped draft plans for 15 different candidates, uh, if including uh, the vice president. Uh, it was easy for us through our research uh, to identify the top issues in rural Iowa and rural America. And the first, of course, is a good job. Uh, uh, beyond uh, having that good job, uh, rural people uh, are concerned about having available and uh, affordable health care, and they're concerned that their uh, education system in rural communities is robust, uh, preparing young people uh, for the future. But again, I want to say that the first and the beginning uh, and the end it is, of course, a good job. Um, uh, slide three, Katie. Um, what we know that uh, rural communities feed and fuel our world. Um, we also know that it is critically important to add value to uh, agricultural products. You know, agriculture has changed uh, over the years. It's uh, certainly changed in even in my lifetime of living uh, and working uh, on an Iowa farm. Um, we are a commodity driven industry at this point in time and uh, um, in order to add value to that uh, to that commodity crop uh, we really need to be thinking uh, outside the box um, when we do that we not only put uh, additional dollars in the pocket of uh, farmers but um, we also create good good jobs in rural communities um, and the ethanol plants, uh, the biofuel industry, has really been good uh, for rural America. Um, it is providing uh, good jobs uh, and money uh, to spend on, on uh, Main Street. Uh, and uh, it seems like uh, we've been uh, talking about this and, and uh, trying to uh, grow this industry for many, many years, but we do know that today, uh, it is an important part of many, many rural communities, besides uh, the opportunity to provide for us uh, some uh, cleaner fuel. Uh, we have really struggled over the last few years. Um, you know, farm income uh, is down, um, and uh, that's not a good thing. Uh, one of the issues that uh, makes it very difficult to attract and, and retain uh, good jobs and, and industries in rural uh, America is the lack of uh, high-speed internet hookup. Uh, for many of you, it's, I'm sure it would seem uh, impossible to think that uh, that, that uh, high-speed is, uh, is not available uh, in many places, but, but it isn't. And we've talked for years about how to do that, but we've never um, seem to be able to to get that uh, that to happen, unfortunately. Uh, crumbling housing stock, uh, crumbling highways and bridges, uh, hospital closures, school consolidation, all all of those uh, those things add to uh, the economic pain that uh, rural America is feeling right now. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, this graph shows you that uh, uh, the uh, net farm income is down uh, almost by half compared to what it was in 2013. And, and uh, that is uh, uh, just uh, incredibly difficult 
for rural communities. When farm income drops, uh, the farm uh, industry does not have money to spend on Main Street, and, uh, and that, is, uh, that is the bread and butter for rural communities. Uh, so we were really kind of on the ropes uh, before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, uh, we really view this uh, here in the heartland as a triple whammy. Um, we had uh, in, we were, the trade wars, uh, which um, you know were really unfortunate and, uh, in my opinion, unnecessary. The it, it became it, uh, agriculture uh, took a, a a real hit uh, because of that. Uh, we followed that up with some uh, devastating uh, floods um, that uh, that further crippled, crippled agriculture and. The third thing that happened even before the pandemic is EPA's decision to grant small waivery refine small refinery waivers uh, from uh, mandated ethanol blending. Uh, so uh, that was a, about a, all of the sucker punches that we could stand, and then we followed that up with the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, uh, ethanol really adds to the economy. Uh, in uh, 2018, um, we lo were looking over 300,000 direct and indirect jobs. We were looking at uh, $45 billion to the GDP and $24 billion to household incomes. Uh, that's a lot of money. And, uh, and so when, uh, when that is not holding uh, true, it, it creates a serious uh, problems here in the heartland. Um, another issue that has been extremely hard on us is the failure to implement the RFS as it was written. Uh, if we had had the re renewable fuel standard uh, standing strong, um, we would have been in a much uh, more comfortable place today. Uh, and, but as I said, we've known the last few years that uh, the ethanol industry has been shaky. And uh, then COVID-19 came along and really destroyed the safety net. Um, I want to say just a word about uh, small uh, refinery waivers, uh, because I think uh, it's uh, something that is a, a little difficult if you don't uh, deal with it uh, on a regular basis. Uh, these, uh, these refinery waivers were designed to help small refineries uh, to allow them to be exempted from mandated fuel blending requirements. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we all understand that. But uh, what has happened over the years is that uh, big oil industries like Chevron, Mobile, um, have used uh, these waivers, been granted waivers, and uh, uh, that uh, that has really hurt uh, the the ethanol industry uh, when it was not uh, the waiver issue was not started for that reason. Uh, in fact, in uh, the last round of waivers that were granted, there were 31 waivers uh, that accounted for over over a billion uh, dollars in in blending exemption. Um, since 2016, uh, more than 4 billion gallons of biofuel were have been diverted from the market. Uh, that was even before, that was of course before the COVID-19 issue. Uh, now the loss of market um, uh, lessened fuel demand from the pandemic, uh, which has been uh, very severe. Um, uh, that has resulted in about 30 plants uh, across the country that have been idled or closed. In addition, uh, another 130 have uh, reduced their production. So uh, we are in a, uh, a very serious situation uh, with the, the uh, ethanol uh, industry today. Um, next slide. Rural Americans know what uh, ethanol does uh, for our communities. Um, our polling data tells us that they support leaders that uh, invest in it and uh, uh, we need to uh, keep that industry strong in order to keep uh, 
rural communities strong. Uh, COVID-19 is having uh, a devastating uh, impact on the rural economy. Um, food prices uh, are soaring, even here in, in the breadbasket, um, especially meat crisis. Uh, uh, while farmers are waiting for some help, uh, uh, I was just want to let all of you know that uh, the price jump that you are seeing in uh, meat in the grocery store across this country is in no way reflected in the in the live uh, markets and what the farmers are receiving. Um, packing plants, of course, uh, have uh, been a focal point, uh, at least in our state and in the Midwest, uh, as places, uh, as industries that have had uh, uh, large numbers of, uh, of employees uh, that have become become ill and uh, that has even resulted in the closing of a plant for a period of time. Um, uh, there are lots of problems in those plants as far as uh, keeping workers safe. And uh, we have to wonder if that is, uh, if the best practices are, uh, are being used uh, uh, to, keep, to keep people uh, safe and keep the, the production line going. Um, we also we know that value-added agriculture um, is critical to a, a strong rural economy. Uh, we cannot survive uh, here um, if we are not uh, uh, if we don't have some way to add uh, dollars to uh, our raw commodities. Uh, and we also uh, in the ethanol industry need to be part of federal recovery efforts. Um, which uh, has been a problem so far. Um, I just want to also say, though, that the biggest problem um, for farmers is always uncertainty. Um, we need clear uh, and certain direction. Um, we have shown through the years that we are capable of adjusting, uh, of, uh, of changing, of, of doing things, of finding solutions. But, uh, but the uncertainty that surrounds us today is, uh, is very difficult to deal with. Um, we do need, uh, in the fuel industry, uh, we do need assistance uh, from the CARES Act. Uh, we need money to uh, flow into, um, into rural communities, rural businesses as quickly as possible. I really fear that uh, some of those um, businesses that have been closed down now since in March uh, will not find a way to open their doors again. I just wanted to mention too about uh, rural hospitals because um, since 2005, 166 rural hospitals across the country uh, have closed uh, and we know that uh, uh, a rural community without uh, health care availability is is one that is struggling uh, and and doomed to fail. Um, jobs leave uh, communities uh, shrink uh, when there is no uh, no health care available. So I just want to uh, summarize a little bit. Um, health care facilities add value to farm income and products. Uh, they put revenue into good jobs and benefits for workers in, in rural America. Uh, policies the administration uh, can and should use today to help, uh, first of all, implement the renewable fuel standard as it's written and intended. Second, set the renewable fuel volume obligations as written and intended and uh, end the use of the unjust small re refinery waivers. Um, ethanol uh, facilities add value. Uh, they put uh, good jobs uh, and benefits uh, in, for workers in rural America. Um, they've been hit very hard over the years, uh, again, particularly due to small refinery waivers. Every inch of value-added agriculture economy puts money into small towns. Uh, they are still, uh, agriculture is the backbone of small towns across our country. 
and ethanol facilities are a shining example of what we can do uh, in rural uh, in rural America uh, by adding value to our agricultural products. And without them, uh, without them, I uh, see that our small towns will continue to to contract and uh, businesses leave and close. Thank you very much, and I'll stand by for questions. Thank you so much, Patty, for your presentation. And uh, speaking of questions, um, uh, we will begin Q&A after our next panelist. Two quick reminders. If you missed any of Patty's presentation, uh, just as a reminder um, that there will be an archived webcast uh, online, www.esi.org. Also, the presentation materials that Patty used uh, will be made available as well. It'll take us a couple days, but check back and you'll also see a written summary um, that includes the Q&A and things like that. So if you have any questions, um, you can email us, uh, eesi at esi.org, or you can follow us on Twitter at ESI Online. Our second panelist uh, is Stefan Unash. Uh, Stefan is Managing Director of Lifecycle Associates, a consulting firm specializing in the analysis of fuel and clean energy technologies over the past 30 years, Stefan has supported state, federal, and international efforts to examine the greenhouse gas impacts of conventional and alternative fuels, including California's zero emission vehicle program and low carbon fuel standard. He has published over 80 studies for government agencies, as well as peer reviewed papers on alternative fuels and life cycle analysis. Welcome, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, and um, I would like to uh give a presentation on the opportunities for uh, uh, biofuels um, and their effects on um, uh, air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. So first I will talk a little bit about what biofuels uh, benefits are and then uh, their role in air quality and greenhouse gas emissions and then how that might fit in some policies for rural development. Uh, first of all, we're all familiar with the um, fuel volumes for the RFS. The uh, projected um, uh, volumes have not uh, panned out and we're uh, not producing nearly the levels of cellulosic uh, biofuels and what we primarily have is uh, corn ethanol and oil-based uh, biodiesel and renewable um, diesel. Uh, there's also been a recent growth in uh, biogas derived from dairies and landfills. Uh, cellulosic fuels have really not um, uh, panned out as uh, projected. And uh, technically, electricity and hydrogen could be generating uh, D3 RINs under the RFS. And there's actually petitions sitting at EPA uh, that are waiting to be acted on. So we actually have an opportunity uh, to meet the RFS uh, with, uh, with many fuels. But let's see what their, um, what their role is in air quality. So there's several factors um, avoid, uh, having to do with alternative fuels that affect the air, their air quality impacts. One is how clean they burn. But the other thing that people don't often think about is what do they avoid? So ethanol has a high octane number. Yes, that makes the vehicle um, operate more efficiently if it has an ox sensor, but also means that the oil refinery doesn't need to produce as much high octane product lower intensity reformers, lower emissions from oil refining. Uh, the heat of vaporization, uh, low sulfur, and the distillation properties of ethanol also help uh, with its, um, with its um, uh, hydrocarbon emissions. Uh, renewable diesel has a very high CT number, 80 compared to 40. That means it runs well in a diesel engine. And again, the oil refinery doesn't need to work as hard uh, to meet um, diesel specifications to meet uh, stringent California uh, requirements. And uh, this fuel also has uh, virtually essentially no uh, aromatics and uh, zero sulfur. Uh, similarly, uh, biodiesel is along those same lines. And uh, biogas. And biogas is used uh, by book and claim to make uh, CNG. Um, but using biogas actually helps uh, landfills avoid flaring uh, or helps them uh, not have to use an internal combustion engine which would have high NOx emissions. It avoids um, uh, uh, dairies and lagoons um, having uh, methane emissions and then finally of course electricity and hydrogen 
which are all uh, potentially derived from uh, biogas or other renewables, have zero emissions in the local area. Um, we uh, did a study uh, that looked at the uh, toxic air contaminant effects of ethanol, and it's a very complicated matter because it depends not only on uh, the properties of the ethanol, but the components that are uh, blended into gasoline. And this chart here compares 5.7% um, uh, ethanol with higher level um, ethanol blends, and it shows the weighted toxics. So basically, ethanol is displacing uh, benzene and um, olefins, which are precursors of 1,3-butadiene. And these here are weighted by their cancer-causing potential. So basically, ethanol helps um, reduce uh, cancer-causing components. And it's a complicated subject because it really depends on how you blend the gasoline. And ethanol helps you uh, make cleaner gasoline. Um, here's an interesting chart. Uh, perhaps it demonstrates that um, correlation is not causation, but it does uh, show uh, that over the past uh, several decades, with the introduction of reformulated gasoline, phase two gasoline, and low sulfur, um, as well as ethanol, um, uh, ozone levels have been uh, declining as ethanol uh, levels have uh, increased in our gasoline to uh, 10%. The 10% that we have today and we have the potential to go to 15%. Unfortunately, we're losing our ability to um, operate uh, uh, flexible fueled vehicles on ethanol because uh, the incentive structure has changed for those vehicles. So a little bit about um, greenhouse gas emissions. As we're probably aware, uh, you need to look at greenhouse gas emissions on a well to wheel or farm to wheel basis. Uh, because uh, for um, if you look at ethanol, it has the same uh, carbon dioxide emissions per um, uh, mile driven as does gasoline, give or take small changes in efficiency. However, the ethanol was recently removed from the air, which is the biogenic uptake. Um, so you need to count all of these on a life cycle basis. Similarly, for electric vehicles, those cars produce zero emissions as they're driving, so certainly you need to count them on a life cycle basis. Um, but first, let's look at petroleum. Um, petroleum includes uh, the emissions from the car, the bottom blue bars, as well as all of the emissions in the, in the life cycle. Uh, there's the uh, crude oil production, which depends on different production types. Um, here we have thermal oil recovery, um, uh, oil produced from offshore wells in Nigeria, uh, which flare a lot of oil, heavy oil, which requires uh, thermal energy and refining. And believe it or not, we even get crude oil from regions in the world where we have to expend our money to fly airplanes, to fly over the Middle East to protect our petroleum resources. And that adds about 4% to the greenhouse gas emissions from um, uh, gasoline produced from uh, such conflict zones. Now, when you look at ethanol, ethanol takes uh, carbon dioxide recently removed from the air, we call that short cycle carbon, and turns it into corn, which produces animal feed, corn oil, ethanol, and um, there's also a component uh, which uh, analysts call indirectly end use conversion. So you could take into account the opportunity cost of the land to grow something else. There's a lot of factors that weigh into the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of ethanol. And this shows, this chart here shows how the thinking has evolved over the past uh, 10 years. And these values are actually the basis for um, regulations that affect how ethanol producers uh, generate revenue, either under the renewable fuel standard or the Cal California low carbon fuel standard. So first, um, the green bars show a declining use of uh, fertilizer over time. So this California Greet 1.8B, this was uh, about a 2009 um, model data. And now we have the most recent data in 2019 from Argonne National Lab. There's been a steady decline in uh, the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that's used to grow corn. Um, also, 
there's been changes in how we conduct the life cycle analysis, a better understanding of methane emissions from natural gas, a change in the electricity grid, a change in refinement and indirect land use conversion, and even better thinking on co-product credits. So today, the best uh, thinking shows that about um, that corn ethanol, just the ethanol alone, reduces greenhouse gas emissions by about 50% compared to petroleum gasoline. Uh, so all of these um, considerations on greenhouse gas emissions have led to low carbon fuel programs. You know, why even have a low carbon fuel program? Won't a cap and trade program solve everything? Well, the problem is uh, transportation is a significant portion of our greenhouse gas emissions. And having a cap and trade program with um, the prices that are in today's cap and trade program would really not do that much to incent someone from not driving to get a cup of coffee, coffee in a military vehicle. Um, we, you, we drive big cars. We have, um, you know, some people have good reasons for having big cars. And um, a cap and trade type pricing, which allows for, you know, forestry and things like that, is not going to cause um, advanced biofuels, Fisher Trump diesel. Um, battery electric vehicles to be built with. So that's why we have a low carbon fuel program in California and in other states. And it's been being considered nationally. And in such a program, it's a market-based program with a declining standard. So that gray line shows the declining standard in California. It's headed to a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And the obligated parties or the fuel producers um, uh, need to either reduce their emissions, which is challenging because 70% uh, of the emissions are in the gasoline itself, or they need to buy alternative fuels and the lowest carbon options um, can participate. This is one advantage over the RFS, which has predetermined um, uh, buckets and corn ethanol can never become better than a D6 uh, biofuel under the RFS. So um, mechanisms like the low carbon fuel standard are attractive. However, they sort of leave out rural America. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, benefits that could be had at the farm level. No-till farming, uh, low nitrogen um, uh, um, release, uh, fertile farming practices can improve the greenhouse gas emissions from corn ethanol, but currently these aren't um, incorporated into any fuel programs. Also, energy crops. Um, of course, we do utilize manure to make CNG. Uh, converting um, converting uh, crops and forests to advanced biofuels or materials. These are all options. And we could even consider um, a land restoration. Uh, farmers have land um, and uh, there's land around the margins which could be used to absorb uh, runoff. Now, farmers can't take this land and simply set it aside, they need to make a living, but with the value of carbon emissions, you know, why not look at how some of this income uh, could be helped to, um, to uh, reduce emissions at the farm level. And here, this chart shows the, basically the complexity of certification programs and the value of the greenhouse gas emissions. So the highest, um, the highest value you can achieve is to get a grant from the government on a really small scale, we won't, that's not really a large volume choice, but the low carbon fuel standard is paying $200 per ton of CO2 reductions. Cap and trade programs are one tenth of that, and voluntary programs are getting about $5 a ton. There must be some way to harmonize farm level activities so that activities such as um, uh, habitat restoration or, or um, or no-till farming that stores carbon in the soil could be introduced as a benefit um, and allow some of the revenue to flow to the farms. Perhaps not at the $200 per ton level, but certainly there's some uh, zone in here that provides opportunities that can help uh, store carbon as well as help the farmer. Um, so we've learned a lot of lessons from these low carbon fuel programs. One of them, is having equity in greenhouse gas reductions is important. Under the low carbon fuel standard, 
fuel producers get credits for having lower emissions. So if you take your um, if you take your ethanol plant and install an anaerobic digester, you get paid much more money under the LCFS than you would under the RFS, which simply would treat the ethanol as a D6 RIN. So there's flexibility in adopting new technologies. Um, also, I work for a lot of companies that are examining investment options. Um, investors are willing to look at the future revenue from the LCFS, whereas there's a lot of uncertainty uh, with the RFS. So this mechanism, having a stable mechanism where a policy persists is very important. And this has allowed, this has enabled uh, the adoption of new technology. Biogas from dairies has certainly, uh, certainly grown. Uh, almost all of the tallow and used cooking oil is headed towards renewable diesel as well as corn oil. And there's been significant investments in cellulosic ethanol as well as um, Fisher Trump uh, jet fuels and certainly electrification. Just look at um, um, uh, Tesla's uh, stock price. So uh, what can we do in the future? There's a couple of things. We could support E15. Uh, we could bring back the flexible fuel vehicle. Fewer and fewer of these are being built and bring it back as a high octane plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So that way you can benefit from having an electrified vehicle and you can bring the um, you can bring the electric technology into larger vehicles. So in, in rural areas, you need pickup trucks, you need, you need larger vehicles. And if it were a plug-in hybrid, you could, um, you could enable uh, still getting most of your miles on electricity with a smaller battery. Um, add RINs for hydrogen and electricity, very easy. Uh, many developers are working on biomass to jet. We know they're going to succeed. Uh, enable innovations. Uh, one of my favorites is manure by wire. Allow ethanol plants to get um, uh, better uh, credits uh, by enabling um, uh, uh, biogas to come in with uh, electricity credits, for example. And consider some of these farm level benefits such as low emission farming and habitat restoration. There's certainly a lot uh, to do at the farm level that can uh, uh, tie in with uh, low carbon programs and, um, and I look forward to an interesting future. Great, thanks so much for a great presentation. Um, you had a lot of charts in your, uh, in your presentation. Thank you for those, uh, lots of good stuff. Uh, if anyone has uh, a need to sort of go into greater depth or review those slides, just as a reminder, in addition to an archived webcast, the slides and materials um, will be made available online. And, uh, and Stefan helpfully included his contact information at the end of his presentation too. Um, we are now going to transition to Q&A and we have uh, lots of time for that. Um, if you have questions out there in the audience, um, you can follow us on Twitter and ask us questions that way. Uh, you can also send us an email, eesi at eesi.org, and some of you are doing that. Um, but I am going to introduce my colleague, Amber Todorov. You might remember Amber. She was my co-moderator for a, our climate adaptation data briefing series back a couple months, somehow a couple months ago. Uh, so Amber, welcome. Uh, thanks for all your help with today's briefing, and I'll let you kick it off with Q&A. Thanks a lot, Dan, and thanks to both of our presenters today. These are really interesting discussions and I definitely learned a lot. So this question's for uh, Stefan, but either of you could answer. Patty, you probably have some insight too. What are the misconceptions held by the public um, that you feel are most troubling and want to get corrected in terms of um, ethanol and biofuels? Uh, one is that it has no um, criteria pollutant uh, benefits. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, the effect of octane and the ability to make um, low uh, carbon, um, uh, low emission uh, gasoline are, are very integrated. Um, and then the other, uh, the other conception is just that corn ethanol is bad. If you look at, if you look at corn ethanol, uh, compared to um, other biofuels, there's a range of carbon intensity, greenhouse gas emission values, and if you want uh, manure by wire, 
uh, you could knock the uh, carbon intensity of corn ethanol, you know, down by, you know, 20% simply if you allowed corn ethanol plants to invest in dairy digesters or uh, manure digesters that make electric power that otherwise would never happen unless they had that investment. So there's lots of, um, lots of options and, um, you know, corn ethanol is reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions just like other biofuels. I might uh, add in, in here something, Amber. One of the uh, uh, arguments that we heard over and over during the caucus season when we had uh, over 21 uh, Democratic candidates uh, uh, for president plus a uh, full staff um, and we were trying to talk about uh, ethanol, we're trying to talk about farming, we're talking about uh, rural opportunity. And many times I, I still heard the food versus fuel argument that uh, somehow uh, we were taking food away from uh, uh, American citizens because we were turning it in, into fuel instead. And uh, we would have to stop and, and have people understand that uh, uh, first of all, the, the crop is uh, what we call number two yellow corn. Uh, it is not uh, food, human food, it's livestock feed. Uh, and the great thing about ethanol production is that through the, through the process of creating the ethanol, they, they uh, extract the sugar uh, and, uh, and turn that into ethanol, but it leaves a high quality livestock feed. And uh, so uh, there really is not a, a great deal of waste and, and that uh, food is uh, uh, used by uh, livestock producers all, all over, actually all over the world anymore uh, as a high quality food. Yeah, on that note, um, an acre of land making corn for ethanol makes as much animal feed as an acre of soybeans. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's really good to know. Thank you very much. Um, so this one's for Patty. In one of your slides, you said how in the spring of 2019, biofuel production buffered impact of trade disputes. Could you elaborate more on that? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I, I say that again, Amber. On one of your slides, you said last year's trade disputes or biofuel production helped buffer the impact of trade disputes. Could you elaborate more on that? Well, of course, the trade disputes were uh, uh, over the, uh, uh, you know, uh, over moving corn and soybeans both uh, into uh, international markets. Um, and uh, we, uh, we rely a great deal um, in the corn industry in moving that product uh, internationally uh, and when we had embargoes uh, placed on uh, on us uh, trade uh, tariffs uh, became very difficult and uh, uh, we caught we got caught up in that uh, with uh, with biofuels uh, and uh, it was really unfortunate uh, but they did uh, 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 suffer because uh, of our inability to uh, to move ethanol across into our into the normal markets. Hmm, thanks. Uh, I am going to dip in to the questions that are coming in from our audience. Uh, and uh, thank you to those who are sending us questions. We're getting lots of questions today. A lot of people find this Good. very interesting. Um, the first one I think is for, for both of you. Um, what are the, how would you weigh the constraints the technological or technical versus policy constraints that are preventing biofuels from being more widespread, from being a more mainstream vehicle fuel. Which, Stefan, which, which, how would you balance those? Is it mostly a technical or technological, or is it mostly a policy constraint that's preventing more widespread use? Well, the policy opportunities are fantastic. So, in, um, for example, in the case of um, D3 RINs for biogas, the, the incentive has been very generous and perhaps it's a little bit, you know, too generous uh, considering 
that the technology was intended to, to make uh, cellulosic biofuels. Um, so the problem is that the federal government hasn't stuck with it. There is an opportunity to change the RVO. And as you make the requirement lower, the incentive effectively is not as strong. Um, so, you know, the incentives work. Um, I talk to clients every day who have me analyze uh, what are the changes they can make to a corn ethanol plant to get a lower carbon intensity score. And they are acting on these um, incentives and, and they do work, but they need to be persistent, persistent enough that investors will believe they'll be around for 10 years. And I might just add, what do you think? I might add on to that. I, I totally agree with, uh, with uh, Stefan's comments. Uh, but uh, uh, I think one of the things that we oft times uh, forget is that uh, how new this industry is. Uh, you know, it, a few years ago, 30, 40 years ago, it did not exist. And uh, so it has gone through it's growing pains like any industry, uh, startup industry. Uh, some things work, some things haven't worked. Uh, it, takes, uh, it takes some diligence. It takes, as Stefan said, sticking with uh, a program. Uh, and one of the uh, programs that uh, uh, is taking a while to, to get to a commercial uh, point is cellulosic ethanol. And we all still have uh, great hopes that, uh, that that's going to, uh, to happen. I think it will, but again, we need the research, we need the incentives, and we need time. Before I send it back to Amber, just a quick follow-up. Um, do you think the public health benefits, the air quality, water quality benefits that are becoming more on people's minds during the coronavirus outbreak, do you think those public health imperatives will help sort of shift that dynamic and maybe encourage greater use of biofuels? Well, I would like, I'd like to think so. Uh, another one of the arguments that, uh, that we heard last winter, of course, uh, was that uh, uh, we have a role to play in, in uh, air pollution. And um, I think some of the data that was being used uh, is old. And, uh, and that uh, we really are on the, the right track to, to cut emissions. Uh, and, uh, and we certainly have a role in the future of doing that. I'd be interested in uh, Stefan's thoughts on that. Yeah, I, th I think the air quality effects are, are largely a co-benefit. Um, certainly producing uh, renewable diesel with a high uh, um, C10 and zero sulfur makes it easier to sell, but the, these low carbon policies are, are monetizing the fuels based on their greenhouse gas emissions. You have regulations on refineries and fuels, and they're not um, fuel, everyone's able to participate, you know, on what's effectively a level playing field. However, where we really need help is with um, higher um, ethanol blends. There shouldn't be mm -hmm. obstacles to going to E15. And we really should consider plug-in hybrid E85 vehicles. There's, this is a problem because, uh, because the um, folks who uh, would like a perfect solution are the enemy of the good. Uh, and uh, it's not, um, it's, I don't know if we're going to be able to have, um, you know, pickup trucks and larger vehicles with a 400 mile range that have to haul horse trailers um, you know, be dedicated battery vehicles, and there are a lot of them in this country, and, uh, you know, why not have them run on, uh, you know, renewable fuel and, and get down to, you know, over 80% greenhouse gas reductions all of the time. Great. Thanks. Amber, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, Patty, this is for you, uh, given your experiences are there things you think that uh, state secretaries of agriculture could do to help the public and policymakers better understand the role, um, health, environmental, and economic benefits of biofuels? Well, definitely, again, I always want to say that uh, but this is a, a fledgling industry uh, by industry standards. 
Uh, I was amazed when I, when I was uh, uh, Secretary of Agriculture in uh, the lack of, uh, in, of good information that even Iowans who uh, live next door to a cornfield or, and or an ethanol plant uh, seem, to, seem to have. Um, so we have a lot of work and using the, the elected offices of the Secretary of Agriculture and the U.S. Uh, uh, congressman, uh, the uh, Iowa legislators, all, all of us have, have a sort of a built-in bully pulpit. We have an opportunity to, to uh, tell that story, and I think uh, that we need to do that. We, I have seen a, a big change. Um, I will tell you that uh, when we started uh, trying to promote ethanol, uh, and I went on the rotary circuit at noon, uh, and uh, I would uh, challenge uh, the Rotarians um, to uh, buy a tank of, uh, of ethanol and drive the car and, and tell me what they thought. And they would come back uh, at me with, uh, it was going to ruin, it would ruin the, uh, the car if they put uh, ethanol in, in the tank. And so I told them the story, and the, the story I'll tell you very quickly is my father, who's now passed, uh, but lived to a good old age of 95, uh, believed that ethanol was, uh, was a terrible thing and that you should not ever, ever put that in your car because it would, uh, in fact, make it, uh, make your car quit running, ruin the motor. Uh, so I would take his car when I was home, I would take his car uptown and fill it up with ethanol. And uh, I never told him and uh, he was happy. The car ran fine and I was happy too. So uh, we've come a long way since those days. But uh, again, um, the, our, our opposition, uh, which are to be very blunt, is, is big oil. Um, they would like uh, us to disappear, and they are well-funded, uh, they are vocal, and, and, they, uh, and they try constantly. So uh, we really have to keep working at spreading a, a good message of uh, renewable fuel uh, of all kinds, because it is about the future, and it is about good jobs, and it is about a cleaner environment. What do you think, um, it is new, as you said, so what, are there other countries that are kind of on the vanguard on this that we could take, you know, some case study of? Well, I mean, we're not the only uh, country in the world that is uh, creating renewable fuels, and certainly I want Stefan to, to address that, but we have real competition uh, for the ethanol industry, and particularly in Brazil and, and other, a few other places. Uh, uh, but again, uh, other countries are, are promoting uh, their fuel. Uh, they ha are trying to establish good trade policies that allow that fuel to move. And, uh, and uh, the, I hope they're not spending as much time as we are uh, trying to bat back um, our opponents uh, that are uh, funded by big oil. Stephen? You um, yeah, I've, I work a lot on helping um, export uh, ethanol. I've been to, uh, you know, Mexico and all over the world. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunities there, but it is, um, you know, it is, um, you know, maddening when we've had a, uh, you know, issues with uh, petroleum supply. We have all of the, um, you know, pollution issues from petroleum that we ought to be able to use our own you know, our own uh, indigenous resources. And, you know, more importantly, we've had laws on the books for 10 years. You know, they're, they're, the, the purpose of the law is to allow the investor to take the risk. And if, if it's really just a uh, bait and switch game, it's not a policy. It's simply someone gets to take credit for writing a law that did nothing. And that's not the purpose of laws. It's supposed to be able, you're supposed to be able to allow investors to make multi, you know, hundred million dollar risks. And then they're supposed, and then they're the guys who, their problem is supposed to be, does the technology work? Not is the government going to change the RVO, you know, based on a whim. And I may have just dithered off of the question. 
Um, thanks. Uh, I'm going to go back to our questions that are coming in. This one came in from Twitter, and I always like to try to make a special note to ask questions that come in from Twitter. So thanks. Um, and this is for, this is a grab bag. So whichever of you has the answer, I'm not sure who to direct it to. What policy options exist to ensure farmers receive at least partial value upfront on CO2 sequestration activities when it takes a little, while it takes a little bit of time to verify um, that CO2 permanence? Yes, this is challenging because uh, some, uh, some economists say that if you give farmers uh, um, an extra, you know, let's just call it uh, 20 cents a bushel, they'll simply compete it away and they will get nothing. However, if you, if you ask the farmer, would you rather we give you 20 cents a bushel or that we have an incentive that goes through the oil company that then goes to the ethanol plant that then uh, trickles down to you, I'm sure they would prefer the former. So um, there's a potential source of revenue from low carbon programs, and it can fund activities that are beneficial. Some of these activities are already occurring. So let's say, you know, maybe, you know, a very high fraction of farmers have no till farming. So, you know, if we paid 20% of the farmers to, who are already doing no till to do no till, that's not going to have a big effect. So the policy has to be sorted out that it'll result in some a higher level of additionality. Um, but there are the mechanisms available. Um, and also, you know, farmers will never be able to come up with the same level of evidence as an ethanol plant. You're buying thousands of bags of fertilizer, billions of grains of corn. You know, can you track every single one of those? Um, like you do a receipt for an ethanol plant, you, you won't, it's not that easy, but there, it's clear when farmers are employing uh, practices that reduce nitrogen emissions. You know, some of these practices um, cost more to monitor and, you know, perhaps, um, you know, take it, take it as an initial step to pay for the monitoring and to pay for activities that have a clear incremental cost but this can be sorted out. And there's um, 20 petagrams, which is millions and millions of tons of carbon that potentially could be stored in the soil over the next several decades. And we need to get to work on that. Thanks. All right, so I have one last question. Um, we hear about cities and municipalities adopting biofuel um, compatible buses or other vehicles for their fleets. Is there one city in particular that you think is doing a really great job um, at this or multiple cities? I, I really am not uh, familiar with what, uh, what all the city, what cities are doing. Uh, I know that uh, there have been a, lots of, a lot of tests done, particularly with uh, biofuel uh, in buses across, uh, in cities across, uh, across the country. I think most of those uh, show that, the, that there's a real good possibility of reducing uh, emissions by, by using biofuel. Um, I, and again, uh, I, would, I want to echo what, uh, what Stefan said about uh, being able to use higher blends. If uh, moving from 10 to 15 percent or beyond is, uh, is really, uh, I think, very, will be very beneficial uh, in our, uh, to, the, to the environment as we, as we Americans resume our driving that, uh, that we enjoy so much and we've kind of put on hold for the last few months. Yeah, in, in California, a lot of uh, uh, bus fleets um, have requirements to use uh, renewable diesel, and that's a lot of fuel. So I don't know exactly if they have the same um, access to do that for ethanol or, frankly, whether they even would. However, in the Midwest, um, I, I think uh, an E85 FFV would make a, a dandy police car. Um, mm -hmm. And there's many opportunities. Um, there's many opportunities for. Um, uh, for um, you know, local governments to use um, to use E85, 
uh, to purchase the 85 vehicles and and there potentially could be uh, cost savings because uh, 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 of the ability of the ethanol plant to sell uh, locally. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for that. And um, your answer reminded me of Patty's sort of switcheroo story. It reminded me of those old taster choice, Taster's Choice commercials where we secretly replaced your gasoline with E85. Maybe that should be something that we worked on. Um, I, I, Local officials would probably frown upon that, but um, um, I, you know, still think there's a kernel there for marketing purposes. Um, Patty, Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and making your presentations. Um, and we're even keeping you over the hour mark now. We're at 301, but thank you so much for your presentations. It really means a lot to everyone at ESI for you to take time out of your day to join us and help educate policymakers and the public about biofuels, rural economies. Um, and uh, the coronavirus outbreak. So thank you very much. Before we conclude, let me thank Amber for joining me today. Thank all of ESI uh, who had a hand in today, uh, Omri, Dano, Ellen, Anna, uh, Maeve, Maya, uh, everybody, Sydney, uh, you could just go on. Just look at the staff page at ESI.org and say, oh, everyone had something to do with today's briefing, which is more or less the case. One last thing before we conclude, um, uh, while you're visiting EESI.org, um, looking at the staff page, uh, saying, oh, all of those people had so much to do with today's briefing, it would be really helpful if you would take a few moments to take our survey. Um, we really pay a lot of attention to the responses that we get, uh, and um, it helps us improve our offerings. Um, also, uh, just to make sure that what we're doing is, is what we need to be doing, and we really appreciate everyone's time that you, that you spend filling out that survey. So thank you very much. Apologies for going a minute or two past the hour, but this was just such a great presentation and Q&A. Sometimes the, the temptation to go long is just too much. So thanks, everyone. Uh, for joining us. Hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday, and we'll see you tomorrow for the final uh, installment of our mini-series looking at natural disasters and the public health crisis. Thanks so much. <laughs>